Let me turn you back to Ecclesiastes. I have thoroughly enjoyed these book studies. They're basically just introductions and somewhat of a review in our Sunday school hour. But sometimes uh, during the week, as these things are being uh, reviewed and put together, uh, I think about how practically these things apply to our lives. And I um, I realize that part of what Solomon's saying is history repeats itself. Uh, The challenges do, the thinking does, uh, the whole reality of uh, living in the world in which we live. I think Ecclesiastes for us is um, additionally relevant because we live in a society that actually purports all of these things that Solomon says will not bring you happiness and will not bring you fulfillment. I'm often caught up in conversations in thinking about um, how much our present context affects the way we think about things. It affects the way we think about Christianity. It affects the way we think about the challenges of life. And I consciously try to imagine myself in a different culture at a different time. The reason I do that is because I realize how prone I am to interpret life based upon where I live and the day in which I live. And sometimes we just got to back out of that. And, And sometimes we're making decisions based upon Um, a a Christianity that is dominated by and shaped by where we live and at the time in which we live. I think a lot of uh, those challenges have to do with how we exercise ourselves in these kind of things and the decisions we make and the directions we set as Christians uh, that would not transfer to another culture. What if we didn't have the option to move somewhere else and work somewhere else and change our context. What if we were in a hut in Papua New Guinea as a believer and we had a choice of eating sweet potatoes three times a day and our Christianity had to be fleshed out in that context? I really believe that type of thinking would help us because I think God's will for us is much more shaped by where we live and how we think because of where we live than it is by what the Bible actually says. Because a husband and wife in any culture has to flesh out Christianity in a biblical way. And these biblical texts do not and cannot be interpreted through the lens of where we live and the day in which we live. That being said, I believe the challenges of Ecclesiastes are cross-cultural and they cross historic time because I think we would agree that there's, there's always this idea that if I could have more wisdom, if I could have more insight, if I could have more knowledge, if I knew more than I presently knew, I would be happy, I would be satisfied. If I could enjoy more pleasure I mean, how, how we scramble for leisure time and how leisure time is held in such high regard. We can't wait to, to find leisure time. And, and, and we're still there. That's what he, that's what he was saying. We're, we're, we're looking for pleasure, uh, things, hobbies, and projects. Here's a guy with unlimited resources who built to his heart's content. If he wanted to build something, he would simply... Say, build it and have the money to build it. That's what Solomon says here. And he says, you know what? Got it built. Didn't do it for me. That's not what God has for us. And so my encouragement to you this afternoon is to try in very practical ways to pull yourself away from where you live at the time in which you live in the affluency in which you live and flesh out your Christianity there and then think it into where you do find yourself living. And allow that to be the undoing of this wrong thinking uh, that, that ends up forcing the scripture into a place that God doesn't want us to force it into. It ends up interpreting the scripture based upon what we presently understand and presently experience. I don't think this is an overly complicated challenge. I think it's a simplistic challenge. 
I think it causes us to step back and causes us to sit down and causes us to, to take these scriptures and to try to get the message that is actually uh, being given here. So uh, in chapter 1, verse 16, there's unrivaled wisdom. In chapter 2 and verse 8, there's unequaled wealth. In chapter 2 and verse 7, there's unlimited servants. In chapter 2 and verse 3, there's unrestrained pursuit of pleasure. In chapter 2 and verses 4 through 6, there's unending projects. I think, wow, what a description. Unrivaled wisdom, unequaled wealth, unlimited servants, unrestrained pursuit of pleasure, and unending projects. And I ask myself, I ask you, do you find yourself in any of these descriptions? Are you caught in the cycle of these life searches? Have you any level, have you at any level bought into the American dream? Are created things and earth side experiences the things that get you up in the morning? Are they the things that occupy your mind? Are they the things that motivate you? Are they the things that occupy your time? Even folks, hardship. Uh, you talk to people and, and the, their experience, their, their place, what they're going through, their testing, that's, that's life for them. Uh, for a guy like me, ministry could be life for me. That could get me up in the morning. That could motivate everything in my life. And I follow through and you follow through with Solomon and he's saying, actually, any of these created things, even any of these creature things that occupy a place higher than our creator uh, is futility. It's vaporous. Uh, my mind immediately went to Romans 1, where Paul talks about a depraved culture that worships and serves the creature the creation more than the creator. And I, I recognize with you how anything in our lives can be given worth or can, or can be counted more worthy of our time and money and thought and occupation and energy than, than our Lord. And Solomon's theme, his repeated message is, you know, that, that's vaporous. That, that will never do it. How many times have you wished that in your life you would have just taken God at his word and not had to experience it to find out God knew what he was talking about. <laughs> Wouldn't that be delightful if we just read something like this and said, got it. But that's not the case, is it? Uh, how many times these things are repeated? Um, uh, I, I have these thoughts and share these thoughts with Laura from time to time when I hear about a decision that's being made. And, and I said, you know what? He's not going to find what he's looking for there. She's not going to find what she's looking for. They're not going to find what they're grasping after there. And I'm interested that uh, Solomon speaks in terms of youth. He speaks in terms of considering these things while you're young. And I expect that's because while you're young is when you are developing patterns in your life that could follow you throughout life. And I have to say, as a pastor, I've watched people go through, I'm going to try this for a while, I'm going to try this for a while, I'm going to try this for a while, I'm going to try this for a while. And trying to love and be forbearing and, and, and at the same time wanting to say to them, you're not going to find what you want in, in where you're searching. And that is indeed what Solomon is saying to us. But then he adds this statement. It's vexation of spirit. I love that phrase because I find myself vexed in spirit sometimes. Anxious. All right. Uh, energized. There's a vexation of spirit. There's a there's kind of a wrangling that goes on. Um, maybe the word best words a churning, a churning that goes on in our spirit sometimes because we pursued this and pursued this and pursued that. It's like that didn't do it for me. It vexes our spirit. It churns our souls. Uh, I expect as well in looking at this phrase that there is part of a nagging emptiness there, a nagging emptiness there. I can imagine Solomon building something else and then going and sitting down in that new thing that he had built and went, 
That's all. That's it. All of that energy, all that expenditure, and there's a nagging emptiness there. And in Romans one twenty six, in speaking in the same terms of worshiping and serving the creature and creating things more than the creator, it says, for this cause, God gave them up to their vile affections. And what that tells us is that we're surrounded by a world and by a culture and by a society that believes a direct opposite of what Solomon's saying. They really do believe. Uh, and, and I think there's a sense in which we really do believe uh, that somehow these things will do for us the thing that our soul is so seeking after and desirous of. I want to remind you what I said in Sunday school this morning because I believe we've got to keep it in front of us. A desire for happiness and satisfaction and fulfillment is God-given and built into us. But it is, it's depraved. It's sin-affected. And so I think why we have to have these things over and over again, why John has to turn back almost the very last thing that's written in the scriptures before Revelation, John says, love not what? The world, neither the things that are in the world, for if we're loving those things, what are we not doing? We're not loving the Father. I, I, it's very interesting because I got a phone call a couple of weeks ago from a gentleman who used to be under our ministry here. And he's in a different area now. And he called me and he said, Pastor, I got a question for you. He said, I, and I don't want to argue with you. And I'm thinking, OK, he's kind of setting this thing up. <laughs> he said, do you still believe that it's one or the other? I said, what do you mean? He said, do you do you still believe that it's either loving the father or loving the world? And my question would be back to him, what you would expect. Well, what does it say in the text? And I felt like as the conversation went on for 35 or 40 minutes, he wanted to negotiate some middle ground. And I'm so thankful he called me because I, I never have thought of trying to negotiate a middle ground. The love of the Father is not in him. And yet, is it not natural for us to navigate a third position? And, and, and to do that, knowing that our Heavenly Father knows everything that's at the root of our souls, is, it's vanity. It's a ridiculous thing to do, isn't it? It's futility. And so as we think this afternoon a little bit about combating, combating the vanity of life, I just want to turn you to the last chapter of Ecclesiastes. And this is where Solomon leads us. And I'm so thankful again that throughout the book, uh, he sends up uh, flares in regards to the answer. Uh, he, uh, uh, this is not a fatalistic book. This is not a pessimistic book. This is not a skeptical book. Now, this is the wise man reasoning with us. He's not fatalistic. He's not pessimistic and he's not skeptical because he keeps stopping along the way and said, would you just enjoy what God's given you? <laughs> Could you just relax and enjoy the good food? Could you enjoy the wife of your youth? He actually says that pretty straightforward. Won't you do that? Would you stop looking for something else? Will you stop searching for something ap apart from where God has you right now? That's wisdom, isn't it? That's wisdom. So the preacher is preaching his message and, and gives us those kind of things. And he comes to chapter 12 and he makes this statement. Verse number one. Ecclesiastes 12.1, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw near, draw, draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the times of difficulty, before the times of trouble, before the disabilities and infirmities, before the old age, before you get to where you cannot enjoy as much the pleasures of the things that God has granted to you, the admonition is remember your creator. Remember your creator. Combating the vanity of life, Solomon says in 
involves remembering your creator. I think we can stop with those four words for just a moment and, and recognize that he is giving us God's answer to the difficulties and uncertainties of life. See, I think why pessimism and skepticism gets tossed at this book is because there's a lot of negative stuff in this book. And, and you know, you get up in the morning and, and the, the wise man said, well, here's what life is like. You work, you accumulate, you die, and somebody else gets to enjoy what you accumulate. Like, oh boy, that makes me want to go to work. And it just goes on like that, doesn't it? It just it serves that up over and over and over again. And so by the time we get to the end and we hear him say, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, we say, okay, this is God's answer to the difficulties and uncertainties of life. This is a fact. This will happen. You will get sick and you will die and things will not go the way that you had hoped they go. Difficulties and uncertainties of life. God's answer is to remember now thy creator. That's God's answer to the difficulties and uncertainties of life. That ministers grace to us, folks. Uh, again, my, my wife is, is uh, my companion and my best friend, the one that I could talk to openly and comfortably. And uh, sometimes she says, you need to preach that. You need to preach that. And I'm thinking, I won't remember it after our conversation. I'm going to preach that. But we were talking this week about trying to help people. And we were sharing things together. And I said, you know, honey, I, I think that we have to stop. We have to stop talking about the challenges and stop talking about the irritating person and stop talking about whatever it is in the details and the mechanics of life and turn their heart to the Lord. I said, I would encourage you to say straightforward, we are going to stop talking about this and we're going to start fellowshipping around our God. Let's agree that our conversation is not going to the conflict. Our conversation is going to remember now thy creator. Because if I am fearing God and keeping his commandments and walking with him, you know what? Those other details will be worked out. And I suspect that we build a pretty complex model when we want so much to put together all the parts and pieces. And we've become very mechanical at this. Why don't you write a book on how to do this? And so we come up with 25 steps on how to love your wife or how to respond to your husband. All this. I suspect that we have very much complicated our lives and, and also caused some challenges with each other. Because now I have a extra biblical model as to what loving my wife looks like. And I have a, and I'm going to pick on Bob because he can take it. And I'm talking to Bob and he's not doing either seven, eight or nine. And I'm thinking, hmm, get with the program, right? Well, the problem is the Bible is nowhere in that whatsoever. We have mechanically created a model instead of Bob and Mike agreeing we will reverence God and we will have him rule our lives. And I know that when I'm reverencing God and he's ruling my life, I love that lady. And I love her in tangible ways, not making up with flowers for some way I've failed her, not doing all the little things that I heard at the couple's retreat. But the love of Christ now dominating me can love her. And she can, in response, reverence her husband and follow her husband because she is, she's convinced that her husband is committed to reverencing the Lord. 
And she's seeing purity of motivation and purity of desire. And so when he gets to the end here, he says, would you remember your creator? I love the way he says that because he doesn't, in this case, say remember Yahweh, although that would be good. I'm thinking, oh, okay, my creator. You mean the one that designed me to bear his image and be in his likeness? That one. You mean the one who invented I'll keep it on the marriage level, invented marriage and knows how it will work. Mike, would you remember your creator? The one who gave you all these blessings when he keeps saying in here, eat your food, drink your drink, enjoy it. Your creator gave you that. And if you'll remember your creator, you won't be stuck in the mud of the hardships of this life because you will be living in worship to him. And when you will understand, you, like myself, may have had a handful of people in your life who were under hardship so much so that you couldn't understand how they could rejoice, and yet they were rejoicing. What was going on in their life? They were remembering their Creator. They were. And I, that's the kind of people I want to hang out with. Why? Because I'm edified by just being with them. And there's not complaint. There's, there's, there's just a focus on their God. And it's not superimposed. It's not superficial. Remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. God's answer to the difficulties and uncertainty. Would you please quit trying to fix people? Is that too strong? He said, were you talking to me? I wasn't talking to myself. <laughs> and I was at the same time. Can we just stop trying to fix people? And, and everybody that gets married has to work through this because you're in a one flesh relationship. You're that, that close to somebody, you know them. And you have to at some point say, you know what, I'm done. My job on this planet is not to change her. And somehow I get warped into the idea that I will love her more if she was, right, more like me. Isn't that scary? If we're going to be transparent, would you please stop trying to fix people? You know what that tells me when I do that? I don't trust the Lord to have his way in her life. I don't trust the Lord to have his way in my daughter's life that are still in my home under my care. I don't trust the Lord. And thus I don't trust them. And thus we're in this constant conflict, right? I'm speaking as a pastor. I got to trust God to change you. I can't do that. And when I get overexercised to do that, that tells you that's a signal. He's not trusting the Lord to do what only the Lord can do. No permanent long-term change will ever happen apart from God doing it. And you can structure up a storm, but you're not going to do what only the Creator can do. Remember thy Creator. And trust Him to work in each other's lives. Trust Him to direct your brothers and sisters in Christ. God's answer to the difficulties and uncertainties of life is remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. God's solution, secondly, God's solution to the vanities and passing pursuits of life. God's answer to the difficulties and uncertainties of life. And God's solution to the vanities and passing pursuits of life is to remember now thy creator. All of those empty things. All of those things that could be in uh, in the right place, the, the blessings of this life that we live that, that become vanities and vaporous because we're trying to find satisfaction there. We're trying to find fulfillment there. We're trying to find happiness there. Those are vain, vaporous things. There's nothing wrong with most of these things in and of themselves. What's wrong with building something? Nothing, nothing. What's wrong with being wise? Nothing. Solomon would never say that. 
But pursuing wisdom so that you will find happiness in that. Now, there's where the there's where the vanity is. There's where the emptiness is. There's where the vexation of spirit is. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, God's answer to the difficulties and uncertainties of life, God's solution to the vanities and passing pursuits of life. And it's God's conclusion regarding wasting one's life. It's God's conclusion regarding wasting one's life. Do not waste your life this way. Turn your attention to Jehovah God. Turn your affection to your creator. Turn your attention away from everything else. While life, he says, now, now, while life is still in front of you. And some of us don't know how much more life there is in front of us. So listen to the way he says it. Remember now, thy creator. And if you're young and haven't dealt with so many of the hardships and challenges of life that Solomon says is part of life, while life is still in front of you, remember your creator. While turning is an option for you. I think he's saying before life ends for you. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Verse 2 says, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble and the strong men shall bow themselves and the grinders cease because they are few and those that look out the windows be darkened. And the door shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Also when they shall be afraid of that which is high and fear shall be in the way and the almond tree shall flourish and the grasshopper shall be a burden and desire shall fail because man goeth to his long home and the mourners go about the streets or even the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher. All is vanity. The whole duty of man, beginning in verse number nine, and moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even the words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further, by these, my son, be admonished of making many books, there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. I fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. I just say to you, the Lord knows what he's talking about. He's the creator. And you'll either take him at his word or you won't. The one is belief and the one is unbelief. But God has answers for us. But as long as you are set where you are and will not bend, you are set where you are and will not bend. And you have not chosen the satisfaction and happiness and the fulfillment that God has for you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this gathering, Father. What a joy the music has been this afternoon again. What a blessing to be able to freely stand here and communicate your word. To try to meditate a little further to make some application of the things that we studied early this morning. To seek to send these dear folk out with things to chew on and to meditate on, and to apply to their lives. And we have truth from you. 
And we are prone to go every direction under the sun to seek for that truth instead of just taking up your word again and embracing it by faith. Father, we have been told over and over again that faith really is the challenge for us. That we are of little faith, that we at times, Father, we lose faith, we falter in our faith. And this is certainly a text that calls us to faith, to believe you, to take you at your word and to set out with whatever days are left for us to be the people that you saved us to be. We praise you and thank you for these things in Christ's name. Amen.